Hey guys, welcome back. For those of you who are just joining in, we are doing grade 12 chemistry. Guys, this is the last segment of the show. I just don't want, I don't want to waste a lot of time. I just want to say, make sure that you're posting your questions on our Facebook page or our email listed below. For now, let's head back to Phil and finish off. There we go. Right, uh, Atik said it all. Guys, post your question. We do keep on answering questions long after the show, so please don't feel like we're trying to ignore you. We are not, we love you all. Uh, all the people out there watching the show, we love you. Okay, so now people were asking, how do I actually calculate KC and nine marks? And you're like, Ugh. okay, guys, just write down the expression you get your first mark. So I'm going to show you exactly how to do that. Okay, so now remember, you need your balanced chemical equation. So let's just talk about how to calculate the initial amount of CO2 from a KC of 14. So we know that KC was equal to our product over our reactants and was equal to our product concentration over my reactant concentration. And that was equal to 14, but let's unpack it a little bit further. Now, if I take CO2 and I add some O2 to that, and there's my reversible reaction. Uh, oh, hold on. I've substituted something in there that's not actually there. Okay, it's actually carbon. Okay, so CO2 plus carbon goes to make us the carbon monoxide, which is a super poisonous stuff, and makes up the gas. Remember that I've got a gas plus a solid, and that's making another gas over there. Pretty important that we know the ratio and the balancing because that's how we come up with a KC expression. Okay, I've got a ratio here and I'm going to point this out really importantly. 1 to 1 to 2. And those numbers are actually going to help out a lot a little bit later on. Okay, so now when we start to take a look at this table that I've just shown you, just like really quickly, don't panic yet. Let's write down the KC first. So KC is equal to the products over the reactants. Now my products were CO, the carbon monoxide, and I'm going to write it over something, and this is really important. CO2, I'm going to show you a little bit of a trick. A lot of you are going to do this. You're going to go, ah, oh, another reactant is carbon, and you're like, ah, oh. whoa, 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 whoa. A couple of things that we've missed out. First of all, what about the two from the CO? Where do I put it? Do I just multiply it at the front? Guys, now here's the trick. Casey, when we're looking at this at a ratio, and we don't have enough time to explain, but your exponents are made up by those ratios. Remember one to one to two? That's where those numbers go. Please don't forget this. Okay, now I'm almost there. And I'm not quite there yet because I'm going to do something that's going to confuse some of you and I'll explain why it doesn't have to be that bad. So I've got CO squared, my carbon monoxide squared, divided by my carbon dioxide, but I'm not going to write down my carbon. And here's why. Carbon is a solid, so its concentration is deemed to be one. So whenever you're working in a multi-phase, that means in multiple phases, uh, so like solid gas uh, or solid liquid, the more condensed phase takes on a concentration value of one. So solids can't have a concentration because they don't spread out through the gas. And that's really, really important when you're burning coal, it doesn't spread out through all the air that it's burning with, it waits until the air touches it on its surface before it burns. So solids in a gaseous environment have got a concentration value of one, and that's why we don't write it in our final KC value. Now here's something really cool. Take a look at that. Now we've got a ratio of these two gases to each other, and that ratio is 14. And that's the first clue to trying to figure out the carbon dioxide, the amount of carbon dioxide, or at least the concentration later on, because I know that they've got this like, ratio of 14. Okay, let's see what else we know about this. We were told that at equilibrium, 168 grams of carbon monoxide is present. Well, guys, if you've uh, been listening to me at all in, in any of my lessons, and even if you've never heard this before, guys, mass is almost completely useless in chemistry unless you change it into the universal language of chemistry which is moles. Mass is completely useless because all chemicals weigh a different amount. You can't say I've got 100 grams of this and 100 grams of that because they have different numbers of atoms inside them. Really important that you change mass into moles even if you have no idea what you're doing guys and you're just like uh, I think I need to change it into moles. If you know what it is and you know how much mass there is go for the moles. So let's do that. So my number of moles of carbon monoxide is equal to its mass over the molar mass of carbon monoxide. Now here's your second bit of easy marks. So we've got our first easy marks over there. 
Our second bit of easy marks is figuring out the moles of carbon monoxide. 168 grams divided by the molar mass of CO, and we need our periodic table to be able to do this, and if you've done this enough, you've memorized that carbon is 12 grams per mole, and oxygen is 16, and if I pop that all into my calculator, let's do it all together. So let's do this. So I've got 168 divided by, and on the bottom there we've got, what have we got? We've got 12 plus 16 in the bottom of that division there, and we've got 6 moles of carbon monoxide. Quite nice that it came to such a nice clean number. So that means that at equilibrium, I've got 6 moles of product. Okay, now I've taken the information that was given to me, and I've done what I can with it. Now let's start putting it into the table. Okay, now if you have never seen this table before, it is the most amazing way of arranging your chemicals inside um, an equilibrium question. I call it the rice table. Some people have got different words for it, but um, you know, it, it depends on what you want to say. But here's why I call it the rice table. I start off with the ratio of the chemicals to each other, their initial amounts, the amount that changes, and the amount at equilibrium, which is pretty cool. So RICE, R-I-C-E, Ratio, Initial, Change, Equilibrium. Now I'm going to rub that out because I'm pretty sure somebody at home can't read and I've scribbled all over everything. Okay, so now the ratio of which chemicals? Well, the two things that we're really interested in. So I would put my carbon dioxide, so it says over here that I've now got this ratio and it says that at equilibrium it is found that I've got 168 grams of carbon monoxide. Okay, so that must be one of my things. So I've got carbon monoxide as, oh, sorry, that's carbon dioxide, that doesn't help. Let's be very specific. Carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide on the left. What is the ratio of them? Where do we find this ratio? Take a look at the chemical reaction. Remember back in grade 10, we were like, balance the chemical equation, here's why. Okay, so one of these is going to make two of those. That is the chemical ratio between those. Now, here's a really, really important thing. The only, only, only row that, that this applies to, ratio, only applies to the change line, please. It doesn't apply to anything else. Now, ratio cannot affect the amount that you actually put into something. It cannot affect how much there is present later on. So the ratio just changes how much of something changes. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make some assumptions, which I think I'm quite inclined to, because when you start out with an empty vessel, the two decimeter cubed vessel that we started out with, I can assume relatively safely that I have not made any product. So there are zero moles of CO. Now, we are looking for the initial amount of CO2 over there. That is our question mark. Um, we don't know what the change is, but here's how you figure it out. Okay, now at equilibrium, we managed to figure out that there are six moles of CO. So I've got six moles of CO. How did I get there? Well, how do you think we got there? Well, it's, it's quite easy. We made them. So what happened is I started with naught. I've now got six. It's quite easy to see that the change was positive six. I made six moles of carbon monoxide during my experiment. Now, here's the really cool thing. The minute you've got anything on your change line, this is like a really, really like well worked out puzzle, like Sudoku. I don't know if you play that. I do. Yeah, it's, it's, so see, like once you get that like one line, you're just like, ah, everything I've just falls everything. into place. Yeah. Now, even if you don't play Sudoku and you're not like super geeks like us, <laughs> and by the way, that's actually a compliment nowadays, geeks rule the world. Okay, so now once you've got that one thing in change, this whole thing works out. That is the key. Here's how you do it. Okay, so now let's take a look at this. I've got this change line, which means that I've got positive six moles of something. How did I get there? Well, it works on the same ratio. So, two is to one as six is to three. Your change line must be in the same ratio as your chemical equation. Now, here's the only trick. What happens is that this change is different for reactants and products. I use up reactants and I make products. So I'm going to say that that is a negative 3 mole. So however much I started with, I subtracted 3 moles, and I found a certain amount at the end. Now you're saying like, oh, okay, I don't, I, mm. now I've got like two missing variables and it's all confusing. Whew. 
breathe because this is a really tough one and this has happened so many times. Well, what did your teacher say in maths when we don't know a name for something or a number for something? Let's call it a variable. Let's say that maybe this is x. So let's do exactly that. So I'm going to say that I started out with x. I don't know how much I started out with, so let's give it a variable. And that's a pretty good approach. Uh, subtract three moles from it, so how much do I have at the end? Well, if you've guessed this, that's x minus 3. And you're saying, Phil, but that's not really a number. Okay, now this is where I need you to concentrate like hugely. If you've gotten to this stage, you've actually got most of your marks. So, I mean, if you've gotten this far, like, you know, big ups, you've passed your question already. You've got about five or six marks so far. You've done the ratios, you've worked out the moles, you've got your KC expression, you've got most of the way there. Now, if you're feeling up to a real challenge, we're going to go find all the way back to X. Breathe, and even if you're like, I don't fully understand this, but I'm going to record it and write it down and figure it out later, that means you're on the right track. So now remember that concentration is your number of moles divided by the volume of the container. So I take my number of moles. So that's x minus 3 divided by 2. Sure, this is getting a little bit complicated. And that's in moles per decimeter cubed if you really want your units. And my concentration over there was 6 divided by 2. At least that just gives me a number. So that's 3 moles per decimeter cubed. Both of these are in moles per decimeter cubed. It just doesn't feel right writing a unit next to like some weird fraction. Okay, so now what we've got to do is realize that now we've got a cool equation forming. I've got x minus 3 over 2, and I've got 3. And those can be plugged into my Casey expression. Whew. Okay, strap in tight, here comes the maths. Okay, so my Casey expression says that the concentration of CO squared, okay, so like bear with me, so I've got x minus 3 over 2, all squared, sure, okay, divided by, and my final concentration of my, sorry, I've actually got this backwards. I've got them upside down. I hope that somebody spotted that at home. I'm flipping this over, and I was about to make that super complicated. Atik, are you feeling a little bit... Relief that that wasn't going to work out to be a squared fraction. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So now just to make it a little bit more fair We had 3 on top squared divided by x minus 3 Divided by 2 Okay, now this is not actually that bad because what we've done is we've just got 3 squared on top which is 9 divided by x minus 3 over 2 Okay, now guys, we've got a compound fraction here. What we've got to do is make it not one. So, tip and times. 9 divided by a fraction is equal to 9 times by 2 over x minus 3. And we know that this whole thing is equal to 14. So, we're getting there, we're getting there, we're getting there. Patience, patience and lots of pencils. So, we've got 18 over there, we've got x minus 3. We are almost, almost, almost there. I hope at home you can see what's going to happen. I'm going to rearrange my equation. So I'm going to take out the denominator to make life a little bit easier. I've got 18 over 14. And suddenly things are a little bit easier, and I can start to work that way through. So what's going to happen is I can take the 3 across if I'd really like. So x is equal to 18 over 4. We can simplify that, minus 3. If you like, you can just jam it all into your calculator. You can simplify this if you really want, but if you're feeling super lazy like I am, so 18 fraction 14, and that's equal to another fraction minus 3, and what we're getting over there, oh, what's happened? Hold Is on. Is that a minus 3 or a plus 3? Because isn't you bringing 3? Ah, plus? there we go. I take on the ball here. <laughs> No, but this is going to happen to you in your exam, and you're going to panic. And I'm going to replicate the results, and we're going to do something. Because if I did that, how would I know that I've made a mistake? And this is pretty important, because this is a mistake, and I think you've spotted it. So how would I know that x equaling minus 1.71 is dead wrong? Okay, now guys, uh, I'd love to tell you that you're going to grow up one day to be an adult that doesn't make any mistakes. Not going to happen. Never. The one thing that does start to happen is you start to get much better at figuring out when you have made a mistake. You get that like weird feeling like, mm, this doesn't look right. So you're telling me 
So now this is wrong, guys. Please don't write this down. Minus 1.71 moles of something. Okay, now that's kind of weird. I can't go down to the shop and buy minus moles of something. It's kind of weird, right? You can't have a negative mole of something. Just doesn't work out. Okay, so now let's correct our answer there. So 18 divided by 14. There we go. Plus our 3. Take a look, we've got a positive number. 4.29. I think that makes sense as a number, right? So that was not correct. So watch out for these maths errors. They're going to creep in all the time. So 4.29 moles of CO2. And I think our question is answered. Sure, that was a bit of a rough ride for nine marks, hey? Definitely. Okay, now guys, I'm not saying that you should just practice this until your fingers bleed and you stop making mistakes because clearly that doesn't happen. But what starts to happen is you start to go, hmm, I kind of know this pattern because this question has been asked in different flavors. I think if I count, and the last time I counted this out, it appeared in nine out of 12 papers. Wow. Almost exactly the same type of question. So guys, expect it. It's coming your way. Be prepared. Phil, before you continue, yeah. uh, Lusanda just has a query on, on your calculations where yeah. she asks, at calculating the number of moles, mm -hmm. shouldn't you have multiplied 16 by 2? Let's take it. Ah, oh, very good question. I'm glad you asked. I'm going to say no, but I've got to explain why. Okay, so Lusanda has asked an important question because this comes back from grade 10 when you're starting to do mole calculations. Okay, now Lusanda's asked us about this question in particular, 168 divided by 12 plus 16. Now, she's asking why I don't multiply the 16 by 2. Now, there's two possible reasons she might be thinking that we have to do that. Now, first one is probably the simplest one, is that she might be thinking of CO2, so carbon dioxide, and it's quite easy to get the two mixed up. I keep on mentioning one, then mentioning the other. So CO2, you would multiply the, the oxygen by 2, then you would be correct, because there are two oxygens. Now, the other one, and this is very common, I see this quite a lot, is that people think, oh, oxygen, oxygen's diatomic, so always multiplied by two automatically when I'm doing more. Guys, <laughs> diatomic only happens when it's an element on its own. So oxygen as an element on its own, then you multiply by two. Or when there are actually two oxygens in the formula. Like if I was to say like CO2, then I would multiply the oxygen by two. Or if I've got O2, uh, then I would multiply by two. All right, so O2 and CO2, that's when I would start to take a look at multiplying that by two. So really important question. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. I hope that this has cleared a lot of the issues that you guys have had. Guys, remember, you are writing exams. Practice makes perfect. So use this long weekend to make sure that you study really hard. And when you're done and get your results, post it on our Facebook page and we'll send you a shout out. For now, it's goodbye from Phil and I. Have a good weekend and stay safe. Goodbye.